There we go, there we go, now we're coming back up to speed. All right. All right. We'll leave that poor guy alone. We don't want to get him in big trouble as long as, as long as he's leaving Libby alone and not giving her a hard time. Don't have a problem with that. Fortunately, we have the NLG here of all. Always glad to see you gentlemen here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin a walking tour of the area. Uh, I really wasn't looking forward to a long walk in the sun anyway. No, Ren's, Ren's up this way. Oh, that's what I saw last week. Okay. It's good to go in future when you see rigs like this and and like we sh those are cameras and they're often live. I didn't know. I was just Just for future reference, you know. Uh, you know, we don't want to make any trouble for anybody. You know. Sorry. Right. Actually, I'm not. Are you going on the tour? I think you should. If you can, you should. Really? We're both streaming, neither taping. We're both streaming. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, it's now. it's being recorded. I lived here for 10 years. It's being recorded. But yeah. You, you know. I'm going to go get you a drink, though. Oh, go. I'm dying water. for a drink. <laughs> okay, let me go get beverages quickly. All right. And then you can decide. We'll see. I can uh, get a tour of Staten Island, actually. Because I may go up to my house later. and to the, my I place. passed my old house, man. It was a trip. Yeah, up on uh, 451 Victory Boulevard. <laughs> I still have Onehouse. I didn't own it, but... <laughs> um, I rented it when I was a kid. Ask him, he knows more about that. But what, are, your are, are your archives high quality? Uh, yes, if we're... It, if, it depends partly on what kind of connection we get. If we can't get a Wi-Fi connection, it's quality's less. All right? But it's all getting recorded. It's all it's all being archived. Okay. <clears throat> and, and then when I I, I I take it off of the uh, Ustream site and put it up on uh, YouTube. Now we've got this lecture, we've got the tour, and I've got a table. Well, Robert's at the table now. He doesn't actually have to be there, but um, I think I'm going to skip the tour. Well, uh, walking around in the sun, I don't know. I turned 57. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that it was just walking around. But I did May Day though. I did that one every last March of it. <laughs> but I was dying at the end. <laughs> it was worth it though, man. I had to do this. I don't know. Talking about possibly going on said tour, but I um, I think they already left anyway, so almost left. Olivia's doing me a grand favor and looking for liquids. And caffeine, preferably. Ah, uh, here we go. 
People didn't come here to walk, I guess. Some people are walking. Yeah. Oh, he didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's a happy small group. Smiling faces. Water fountain. We, we never used to come down here when I was a kid to play or anything. I'm sure it was here then, though. We moved up the hill. We played around uh, as kids at uh, Silver Lake Park, which is well up the hill from here. Fight check! Ah. Fight check! to the daughters of the American Revolution. The perfect sort of place for us. Because after all, the Occupy movement is made up of patriots. there was going to be some other Folks, please come by the talking statue. event. I'm not sure what it was. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Cool guy. We didn't want to give him any trouble. Beautiful day, nice breeze, sunshine. There'd be a lot worse places to be on this beautiful day. See that? It's a small park. We're looking at the exterior corners and edges. And I'm walking around in circles. Back there, not very far. <laughs> See, somebody brought chalk. Uh, this is probably what I'm missing over here. And the 
three movements I personally took part in that shaped my activist life were the, what most of you would call now the Clamshell Alliance. to refer to Mountain Dew as possum piss, <laughs> but it works. We don't do drugs, we do Mountain Dew. <laughs> Just hook me up to a caffeinated line. <laughs> you know, I be, I be medic, I need a little bit too. I got my, I'm going to go back and get some food in a minute. Okay. Lunch is not impossible. Of course, what actually happened was that you had beaten back the movement. I myself had beaten the 
And uh, so we had a sitting there, and I had the whole thing acted like I, that was my mom. I knew her. I knew her. So she came like I was the son, and, I was, and they couldn't take Ryan out of the crowd. And the line there couldn't say, who was the defendant? Not that I, I don't know which one it is. So the judge didn't like that. But that wasn't the ultimate reason, because they had a video of who actually was rapping there, and it wasn't Ryan. But somebody did ask that. I actually met the guy years later. We always thought it was a lie. But it turned out somebody really did blow out of the top. They broke the guidelines. And then, uh, but it, but Spoon Up Bombs came out of it, so maybe it was a good thing. Anyway, so the original Spoon Up Bombs group um, was an affinity group. And we were fledgling at our use of consent. But what we understood was that we needed to be able to have people, what you might call a shorthand, buying the commitment to why you're doing whatever you're going to do. Especially when you're a group this size. If this group's going to decide to do something, which is really going to happen, you want everybody in this group, and in this ongoing group, to the very least say, I'm okay with it. At the very least, if they're, if they're resisting, if they're rolling back, if they're going to be resentful, then the next decision you make is going to be impacted by that resentment, that holding back. Never mind the current decision. If it is just a single decision, it affects the whole dynamic of the group. So, so while we didn't know consensus very well, and I hadn't used my book yet, I was still just learning it. What we did understand was we had a trust each other very, very deep. We had to learn to trust each other very deep. And didn't come with the territory. Even though three poses looked the same, we were all white, we were all young, talented, we were all people educated, you know. But still, you know, the men and the women, a lot of issues going on there. Even, you know, there were others and non others, homosexuality, there was a lot of stuff going on that we, we had a hard time trusting it. We all were all the freezers, right? And so we developed this idea. I think, again, this is very, very important. We had this thing at the very beginning of the Tuna Bomb Collective. We said, each bona fide member, once you become a member of the collective, you live in a house, you are full time doing it, 24 7, 365, and any bona fide member of the group, of the collective, could call group group. With the group meeting, talk about the group. And when a member calls group group, it has to happen in 48 hours, and every member has to be there. And once the meeting starts, we cannot end it with everybody satisfied. And sometimes group groups go on for more than a day. Unless we were living We got up in the morning, we had breaks from meals, and we break from sleeping, we had two breaks and all that. So we came back to the meeting, and we did nothing else but work on it. And of course, so there was issues of asking somebody to leave the group. That was the first thing that they did in my house. It also happened for security issues, or rape happened in the house. We had to deal with that. You know, so it was a way that we could show up and meet people. And we did. And it was powerful because we had that commitment. So that's an example of the level of kind of bonding that I've talked about with any of you can do to be able to do the things we're doing. So in the Food Not Bonds example, we didn't recognize that the, the, the period came to Massachusetts in the early 80s. There were over a hundred anti-war groups. There were like 75 solidarity groups in various Central America, like in the Metro Boston area. Literally hundreds of progressive groups. And every single one of them was small and was not growing. You know, they had a stable band of people around them. And they had a manifesto. They had the right answer. Okay? And they made you agree to their manifesto in order to belong to the group. And that's why they didn't have any members. Because their manifesto was very narrow and deeply defined. And we were a food not bomb group. We identified as anarchists. We were reading Emma Goldman and Kropotkin and, and, and Karl Marx. And we would read and study it. And we said, well, we don't want to tell anybody what to do. We're sort of the opposite of anarchy, right? And we actually want people to think for themselves. So we don't want to write a manifesto. But we do want people to join what we're doing. So what we said is rather than have a manifesto, we will have an activity. We will have something that they can do. If they do that activity, they will learn the politics that we believe is true. They will learn it themselves because they will have the experience of it. And so what we said was, there's so much food being wasted right now in our society, still to this day. And so if you're creative, you have a theatrical bank, you know how to manipulate them, you can collect a huge amount of food for free right here, right now, every day, in any city in the United States, be wasted, it's perfectly edible, you can collect it, Give it away to people as an environmental issue, not as charity. They say, please eat this. If you eat this, you're helping me, because otherwise I have to throw it away, and I got this because I didn't want to be thrown away. Totally fundamentally just the whole dynamic of charity is on my head.
and being inside is so wealthy, and we kind of know that, it really is obscene that we have anybody going hungry. Because we're throwing away more food than there are mouths eat it, in fact, right now, today. That's been two to 30 years. There's now people being like, I try to get straight main food policy to protect this fact. But they don't want any part of it because having hungry people is good for capitalism. And they're never going to end hunger in this country. It's a perpetual machine to keep hunger in place. So it's going to be done, it's going to be done by the people, and it's going to be radical politics because they hate food not bought. They don't know how to stop it because there's no centralized anything. Now, this was designed to be an activity around three core values and collect food and give it away. One value is nonviolence, or anti militarism, which is codified in the name of food not bought. There's a clear anti militarism. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. Vegetarianism is exactly a subset of nonviolence. But that's because it's a better kind of food to give you and better for the planet. It's safer to do on the street. And consensus decision making, which has been interpreted by the kids that do food not bombs as no leader. Collective decision making. And they stumble through it and do the best they can. But they understand that the goal is that everybody in the collective has a voice. They kind of have a spirit of group movement. They understand that what they're striving for is not that. Now, of course, informal, uh, you know, non official, uh, charismatic types take over and dominate, and that happens, of course. But the culture of food not bombs throughout the world is to be leaderless and allow unusual or non empowered people to step up and take a role. But you can do it with five people. It's all it takes, and it takes no money. So you don't have to fundraise, you don't have to have money, you can just use a bicycle, you can use a seat, but food that you find by being smart, creative, and giving it away. So that's spread literally throughout the world. And most people don't realize that there are major networks of up bombs in Europe. That's been going on for decades. I, I mean, the, 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 the Germans had more national gatherings than the United States had of food up bomb gatherings. Um, it's very big during the Bosnian Serbian War. And Croatia and Bosnia have big food up bomb networks, but they actually really help in a time of crisis. The chapter of Funa Bombs in, in um, Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, in 2007, got a national award as a humanitarian group. It bumped me out because Funa Bombs is not a humanitarian group. But in Indonesia, Malaysia, that's the way they present it. And they're big. They're very successful. I saw a video of this young man in his mid-20s, late 20s. And they speak English there, I guess, in the former colony of England. Standing in Kuala Lumpur, the table that looks just like that table here, you know, the food table over there, the food not bomb essential picture. And he picks up my book, the food not bomb book, and says, This book changed my life. But that's it was designed to be an affinity group, decentralized, no hierarchy, no centralized organization, because then they couldn't stop. It's a hydra. You stomp on one food not bomb, you five more pop up. That was the whole design of it. It works beautifully. It's still going on. It's bigger in most other parts of the world than in the United States. And it's pretty big in the United States. And in the United States, the food of bomb has escaped and changed both local state laws to make it so that this public space is safe for places for movements like this. And the food is shared without uh, the food is free, without harassing by the police and not selling food. They don't recognize the food. But we carved that space out. It's still worth fighting. I'm wishing that some of uh, like the ACLU would take our case because it's so funny. Three or four years ago, when I was here in New York trying to get them to take our case, they were saying that it wasn't a consensus. Uh, I said, How many cities do we have to be attacked in before it becomes consensus? At that point, we were simultaneously being attacked in five different cities in the United States just three years ago, and that was maybe double the number of total attacks in And so that's really as well. And they didn't see it. Back in, um, I can tell you the exact day, the day that O.J. Simpson had his famous car chasing, all TV channel like that, that day was supposed to be a huge day of food not bombs history. Because, I mean, the green people in L.A., their national office, I think they're still a national office too, but their, but their office in L.A. was hosting a press conference for food not bombs, where food not bombs was going to announce that for the first time ever, Amnesty International, this very reputable, very cool organization, was going to declare food not bombs activists prisoners of conscience in advance of arrest. And the reason why they did that is because they observed what was happening in the United States. And what the police were doing around the country was 
you know, buying those gas masks, go down to the Mississippi and get some stuff. You know, certain things were specialized in whatever was needed for our taxi. So if the coordinators had to do a certain thing, you certain things that had been identified, and then there were other things that were sort of like, you know, we're just volunteers. We'll just show up whenever you need us. So we even did things like back in the, the pamphlet days, but also during the, the, um, the budget assistance days, we would actually organize role plays, large scale role plays, where like several hundred people of Boston, we would find an abandoned warehouse or, or whatever, and we would go through the role play of what we were planning to do as our scenario. And so I, I should tell the story, just how powerful, how beautiful it was. And of course, this is where I learned to think. This is the crucible where I learned to think, where I wrote my work in the steps to have this happen. And actually, happened to me. This literally happened. The call in Boston, now that they did in days, kept changing it to try to do it with the changes they did. So by 85, it was if they fund the concert, if they get U.S. tax dollars to pay these mercenaries, we will call the play. We'll go out. Okay? And so they did. I think in May of 85, it was fixed. So we had this huge action. So we knew it was coming. We had a spokes council immediately, like the weekend before, so they were going to go to session. They knew they were going to vote. And so we were all there, okay, I had to get on a Wednesday to meet with the And at the Spokes Council on Sunday before, there was at least 125 people here, representing close to 2,000 people in fact. And I'm facilitating, along with Lisa Possibly, and um, we're testing for consensus on our action, our plan, which was to um, blockade the doors of the JFK Federal Center and shut the building down, we shut the federal government completely down by blockading the doors. We had planned this all out, we role played it, we were fully prepared, we knew the was going to be brutal, we had lots of people to do it. It was a big dramatic event, but probably pretty violent. And at the very last minute, we were testing for consent, somebody, a woman in the back, middle class, middle aged woman, probably white, says, I just can't go along with this. This is not me. My friend works in that building, in the labor department. I've been talking to her about the country, about what's going on. And she doesn't quite believe me, but she's beginning to lean me towards us. If she shows up to work that day, she sees all these actors blocking her way to work, she won't talk to me again. It'll be over. I've lost her. It doesn't seem like an action that we do should cause that. That seems backwards to me. And everybody's so oh, sit down, sit down. We've got to, you know, we've got to have this. We're like, quiet, quiet, everybody quiet. Let's hear, let us speak, let us speak. She finishes the statement, and everybody's like, no, no, we have to decide now. So we hearing the genuineness of her voice. But she was genuinely concerned. She wasn't, you know, making something up. She was genuinely concerned. She was trying to help. This is our standard. Right? She was keen on the thing. She wanted to do the She just lost the law. So we said, let's just take this. This is important to her. Let's take 20 minutes. Break up into a finish group. Everybody break into a small group. Talk about 20 minutes about what could possibly be different about this action. We wouldn't have that outcome, but still do our action. And in 20 minutes, we came back with a proposal that instead of blocking the door, we would occupy the lobby all day long. We'd start at 10 o'clock in a, a federal building with a three-story three atrium that could hold a thousand people. Uh, you, you guys are familiar with that. This is Boston. It's a federal building. And so we said, we'll, offer, we'll, we'll create a town hall, a town meeting with as many people as we can. And that way, everybody who goes to that building will learn our message. And at the end of the day, we won't leave. It's our building. It's our action. We're going to stay there. And so we did that. It was a tremendously successful action. Far better than the action we were planning. We got 558 people arrested, including me. That was another time I got beaten pretty busy. Because I was completely not cooperative. I was completely left off. 35 years before, I was completely not cooperative. They had dragons everywhere, including in court. And the judge went ballistic. And the cops were also there. They dragged us out. They dragged me by my feet down the flight of stairs. Really brutal because I had the choice of destroying my back or destroying my head. I broke my back. Uh, so we um so that was the point being that we had this amazing affinity group structure where we could move quickly. We could actually function in a way where we could move 150 people in 20 minutes off of, of a really well planned action onto even better things spontaneously. And it worked. Afterwards we evaluated everybody agreed that the, the earlier action was a negative press, it would only last a few days. As it turned out, it was one of the beautiful things that 550 people in the rest of it took four days to process everybody. Partly because we weren't cooperating, we were messing up, we kept changing the wristbands, 
doing amazing production. And because we were in jail for four days, every day there was a news story about the protesters in jail. And every day it was on the front page. And every day the people on the outside got to do demonstrations before the people arrested. It then for four days instead of one. All these kind of benefits. So the major message there was by that point we had really learned contention. So we both had really skilled facilitators. And the message there, this is the hardest thing for people these to these days to learn, is that there's a difference between Hello, process there. and content. In any meeting, in any activity, in any group dynamic, you have process and you have content. And the mistake that young activists make, and I mean by young I mean people new to activists, not their age. But the mistake they make is they think that the values they bring to the context, like inclusivity, egalitarian, uh, honest, uh, uh, economic justice, those values, they want to apply those same values to the process. And unfortunately, it does not work that way. I didn't make this up. This is my observation. I wish it wasn't this way. But my observation has been that if the process is rigid, absolute, clear, defined, you might say fascist, you know, totally rigid, then that allows maximum safety, maximum creativity, maximum flexibility. The reason why we're able to change that decision I just told you in 20 minutes with 100 people and a big deal that we're about to be called out because it's about to happen was because of a lot of safety. People trusted the process. They knew the process. They knew how it worked. They knew the facilitators were on task. They knew that we were right to let the women have a voice. They got the 20 minutes is not too much to spend on this very, very, very important thing. And when we started that 20 minutes, I would say 99% of people thought we'd end up in the same place we started. Nobody imagined we'd actually shift the entire action. And yet it came out of the creativity of the moment because it was the truth. And we were able to sustain it by having a really rigid structure and strong facilitation. But these days, people don't want that. They think that somehow against our principles. And then what we get is a mess. That doesn't live on Christian law, and that's really stop. So again, we stop directly, definitely, and we certainly expose the truth what actually happened, so that these days many more people than otherwise know about what really happened back then. Although still far too many people understand the October surprise and the whole art of the domination and control of Central America. Why we have so many illegal immigrants, why immigration is such a issue in this country, because all the people who are being attacked there came here, and now they're a problem, because they're awake, they're not willing to be oppressed, and they know they're oppressed. So, that's what I see actually here. We involve organizing by small groups, and small groups can be self-sufficient, autonomous, but the way you organize the larger groups is through consensus decision-making and spokes council. But this book right here, this is a book. This is a book I wrote in 87. When I went to the coordinating council of the Pledge of Business, right, and we was there and all these people are sitting around the table, and I say, we're having people join this pledge. We're having people sign the pledge 100 people at a time every week. You know, every week we're getting 100 people signing up. We're forming affinities as fast as we can, but they have no way to plug into the process because they don't know consensus. The new thing to all these people. They know voting, but we're not using voting. How do they plug in? So I said, well, we should be teaching them consent. And everybody looked at me and went, great idea, CT. And you know about volunteer groups, you know that meant. You do it. So me, being totally the optimist, totally naive, I was the young at the time, I said, oh, great, I'll do it. Because I assumed there would be a book. And would say, oh, this is how you do consent. Start here, go to these steps, and there. You know, there's a book of Robert's Rule, called Robert's Rule for how you do voting which is way more rules than anybody ever wants to know about how to right? <laughs> so I think it would be a book like that. Well, much to my disappointment and bummer, there wasn't one. I couldn't find one. I was going to do a study group. I couldn't get them to study it. So I had to write. And again, I started out thinking, taking a couple months, maybe, you know, a few months, you know, I've done. And all I was doing was writing down what I learned, I thought. It took a year and a half. To go in 87. By 87, the pledge has gone by. It was still around a little bit. It's still around today. But mostly it's past. So I wrote the book for that movement, but it wasn't around. And it turned out that I'd done something new. And I gave it out to people. I didn't put my name on the cover. I didn't put Amy's name on the cover. I said, I didn't do it. You knew it. It's just what I learned. And people read it. No, no. You, you changed it. You added some things. I did. I added two things. Or a couple of small things. Uh, I'm not going to work now. That's natural. Then, uh, two years, three years ago, because I 
discovered I have PTSD, because I mentioned all those meetings. I've been arrested on a few times. If you heard that, I don't think they put in contact. I don't get arrested for every protest I go to. So I think it's 500 protests, but I stopped counting. You know, that's ridiculous too. That's, and, and I've been to like thousands, thousands, thousands of meetings. I'm, I'm crazy. That's what I've done with my life. Okay. But because, I mean, some of those arrests, all the rest of them are brutal. They don't, they're not known for their extensive. And depending on the city, depending on the cause, they're more or less brutal. You can't do so with a new meeting in the bomb. There's thousands of arrests in the bomb. So every time they saw me, that I had a conjunction against me personally. I had a personal conjunction against me. So if I just showed up on the street, they would arrest me. And I got arrested too much there. I have my own video tape. I'll let you put it on YouTube when I'm ready. But I have my own video tape of the San Francisco police torturing me right on the street. And it's only 20 minutes long, 20 seconds long, but we've been tortured for a long time. And you actually see the police officer. I'm on the ground, going limp. I'm handcuffed, or they use those plastic cuffs on my back. I'm handcuffed, I'm laying on the ground. And a cop walks over, he puts his knee in the middle of my back and says, get up. Which he knew I wasn't gonna, and he knew I couldn't. And then he proceeds to push his little soft spot right here behind my ear. Really, really, like my head's on the ground, he's leaning into it. And that hurt a lot. It hurt so much that I see two cops, two cops were bigger than me, off by reacting. Which is a change in my, in the video tape is really ugly. But that's a change because prior to that, I wouldn't show him. I was second discipline, and I was known in New England for being able to be beaten by the police and have it look like I wasn't even there. And I just was not there. I left my body. That's how I did it. I meditated to practice. So I would leave my body, and they would beat on me, and I just wouldn't respond. But at the end, I realized I was doing violence to myself by not responding to the violence they were doing to me to show them that it hurt as a way of communicating. So I started screaming uh, and twisting. And they eventually just came in my shoulder and left me. This is a video tape that shows it. The point is, I have PTSD. I didn't know it. And three years ago, I thought I was dying because I was brain injured to go. So my, my friend, Jerry, kind of wealthy person out on Long Island, he let me live in his house for a year to write this book. And he wouldn't let me get it. He's going through my cold in my life. I thought I was dying. I didn't die. Yeah. And I'm doing better. I've, I've, I've learned how to use my story. Medical marijuana. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this book so I wouldn't die without written it. This is how to use this model for affinity group structure and for cities of up to 100,000 people. The idea being that I believe with this model, with this book, you could run a city, a group of 100,000 people without any politicians, without any professional leaders, without anybody doing it full time who's in charge. That's a group of people using consensus, running their group up to 100,000. And the reason why I go up to 100,000 is that it's, uh, I do maintain still a face-to-face -face meeting. And of course, they're all small meetings with, with uh, folks council. But if you're involved at a level of larger than 100,000 in a single organization, you're going to some of the meetings. It's becoming a full-time job. You can't have a regular life. But everybody else, up to, I mean, so a group up to 100,000 is below. You can run it, I believe, the governance of it, whether it's a city or an organization, by contention, without leaders, without professional leaders. So you still have, you still have the government workers, the people implement the decisions. You still have the coordinating council implementing decisions. They do a lot more work. They even make a pay. But the people making the decisions would be the people. It would actually be a government of the people, by the people, and, oh, wow, maybe even for the people. So I believe that's actually what this book is. I believe that revolutionary. I'm actually encouraged by some people recently that come into my life um, who are saying it's not just a better meeting process, it's a better way of relating human to human. And it's called value-based So um, unless there's any questions about what I've been interested in so far, I have to take questions right now before I can spend whatever amount of time I have to go to work over there at 3 o'clock because I managed to get totally broke. I do, on the table, yeah. I'm supposed to be selling them, but you're a city owner, so hopefully people can just have a side on them. That's what it is. Um, the, in, in the, 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 the city, yeah. Um, how do you think, you know, like right now, like, one, I recently heard someone say that, like, civilization is a collaboration problem. It's always, and we keep creating better and better ways to collaborate. 
also that we have all of this like different social media technology now. How can that help? Not replace, but how can that help the take that social technology so that we can be organized in these new more peer to peer, you know, local ways. Well, I mean, we have to call when people talk about including the top itself. I think you're talking about the iconic social technology. I have a big concern about them, and this is, seems to be pretty obvious, and yet it seems to be in denial about this like everything else. But denial is a real problem in this country that we're really good at. We all love to see media. We're all in denial. Uh, uh, the issue is, is that we know, I mean, people say glibly that um, that communication between humans, 80% of what actually is communicated is nonverbal. You say that all the time. People say no one ever objects, no one, I haven't seen any scientific evidence that that's not true. And you seem to accept that as sort of conventional wisdom. And yet in the electronic social media, virtually 100% of that nonverbal communication is cut out. So what you're left with is a 20% effective communication style that you're then relying on to do all your communication. Major problem. So what we refer to as social technologies, not so much Facebook and, and tweeting and stuff like that. They're fine for communicating, just communicating. That's all they do. They just communicate data. And often really bad the spin, the nuances get misinterpreted. And, you know, I don't know, in the early days of email, People had a really hard learning curve about what a media mill actually was. There's all kinds of miscommunication that happened early on, but you know, nowadays aren't there. They're so, still They still have but, you know, um, We call social technology things like um, learning how to do a checklist, diet, one on one. The idea that this is actually true in the present existence of the board dating council. We had a policy that if you clash in the meeting with somebody, you clash. Even if we worked out in the meeting, you were supposed to go check in with them after the meeting and say, are we clear? Is there any leftover feelings? And if we were doing such high-level work, you know, really intense, and, really, and we were inviting people to break the law, and we were going up against the federal government, we knew we had to be solid. And we couldn't just, you know, have little bickering to get in the way of our solid work. So we had, the policy was we were expected to check in. If you checked in or you didn't check in, and you checked in and what didn't go well, then the next meeting, the group would check, and if we didn't, we would assign a mediator from within the group and say, you have to work it out. We can't have either one of you in this group if you can't work together. We were that highly disciplined. So, uh, so, so being able to do um, NBC, nonviolent communication, technique. As a technique, I support it. As a worldview, I do not. As a technique, it's really good. Learning that technique, learning uh, the thing called part of now, which came out of a larger technique called the Z4. The Zeg Forum came out of an intentional community called Zeg in Germany that is very radical, very political, they did a lot of squats, and they did all this technique of sort of going deep with people on a personal, individual level, not just a political level. So what they learned in political movements, what we've learned, is that it's more important to, bond, to create webs of connection that happen in face-to-face -face connection, in real experiences that are non-linear. Non-linear is an important aspect so much so that there's a man, I don't know, has anybody here heard of sociocracy or dynamic governance? So, there's a version of group or organization that's very cooperative, but still hierarchical, and friendly towards consensus decision making, that came out of policy, right, right. and it's working, and businesses are using it in Europe, and it's very good, it's more positive, consensus, more collaborative. And a lot of groups are, that try consensus and fail because they don't take it very seriously, in my opinion, they don't make it value-based, they are moving to sociocracy. The guy in North America who teaches his name is John Buck. I'm a good friend of his. He and I work together. And we talk regularly. And where are we going? Uh, heart of Now. Oh, the Heart of Now, right. It's that... Um, that um, People working in dyads, people right. working having that, that face time, non-linear. And I got together because we both were, we're both excellent facilitators. We're both the top of our game. Right? We're both national figures teaching the government. And we got together and we were having social salons. And he and I get together for breakfast once a week and we live near each other. And um, we both realized that we, with all of our skill and all of our knowledge, regularly have groups of 20 or more get to stuck places as they're trying to make a decision. They get in stuck places. 
and there's nothing we can do about it. And we were frustrated by that, because we realized it wasn't facilitation, it wasn't more facilitation, it wasn't better facilitation that was going to change that. And we also saw that it wasn't necessarily even the group doing anything wrong. It was sort of like what happens to individual people and groups when they get to this deep material, trying to make an important decision. So we backed off and started looking at a larger picture of what's going on. We started studying how the brain works. And we got way into where creativity comes from. But we go into all that. It's very fascinating. John thinks that we stumbled upon something around creativity that's as exciting as the theory of relativity was for physics and ideology. If it's true, it's going to knock the people's socks off. But we're still working. We haven't affected it yet. But as we're experimenting, the reason why I'm telling you is so we're working on this, studying the brain. The thing is, I put up this theory of how the brain works, and John, the scientist, he's from corporate America. He got into sociology and saw that the way that voting in corporate America is dysfunctional. We want a better way to have meetings for businesses. He's, you know, American. He's a little bit older than I am. He's not trying to tell you to be a revolutionary. He just recognizes that things have to change. So um, we were looking at this, and we said, we decided to take a group of people and to have a meeting, start a meeting, and when we, just randomly, we didn't, couldn't predict that we had stuff played, and we can't, we can't program it. That's the point. We could, but we could control it. We can't. But we decided to just randomly invite people as we're trying to make a decision, completely outside the box, go to random word association. Okay, so we're having a meeting, and we just said, okay, every stop, they, they knew we were going to do something, they didn't know what. We had them five minutes of a, brain, uh, of, you know, a brainstorm or a shout out where people just said, just, 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 somebody shouts out a word and then if you, if you resonate with that word, you can say whatever word resonates with anything you want. And we had people do that, single words or phrases, for about maybe not even three minutes. And then as roughly as we started it, we ended it, and then we started the meeting up again. And the next thing that happened, the other, the really quick after that, was that somebody had an emotive experience. They broke down. They blurred out something that hadn't come out yet. And it turned out, and then we went deeper with that, what's going on there, and something came out that these people have been introduced to the intention of being two been living together for like, more than a decade. And it turned out that this one guy was having a problem with this one woman because she reminded him of his mother. And he was reactive to her saying what she was saying. Not because of what she was saying, but because he heard his mother's voice. That's first, right. But he wasn't, he wasn't conscious of it, and it had been going on for years, and it came out because what we've noticed with random word association, is, and what we were arguing, was that people start out with apple, sky, cat, you know, weird stuff, and they just kind of go, but eventually people start saying words like sad, or emotive words, and where's that coming from? And, and, and you notice that the, the word association kind of flow, it kind of makes sense of it. But they lead to emotions. When the emotions start coming up, people are activated. And then we shut off that part and go back into our work, and they don't get deactivated. They're still down in that space. So that stuff comes out, and we get what's really going on. Now that's social technology. See what I'm saying? That's learning how to work with each other. So what you're saying is like the digital is like, you should keep the digital just for like the basic organizing thing, like helping with schedules, when people volunteer, like the logistical. Administration. I'm not sure. I think the important stuff for face to face and encourage more right. meetups. But I'm, I'm very holistic. So I would say, just like the, 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 the fact that we all use mobility aids, like certain resources, we all use mobility aids. Some of us have two legs and we use cars to go long distances. We're not going to walk. Because, and some of us don't have use of legs and we use those that just do the average getting from here to the point from here to there. We all use mobility aids. Well, in the same way, if we cannot be in the same room together, then we use technology. We have, uh, 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 you know, at very least, a, a conference call. Maybe we have Skype or something to see. Maybe we have an avatar and a 3D projector. You actually see that, right? All those are better. Better than not doing it at all. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that I don't know of any technological alternative to being face to face because there's things that are communicated face to face that are even like all, all factors and, you know, cosmic energy of you know, all of us sitting here together interacting this web of eye contact. That, that's why we sit circles, by the way. The main reason why we sit in circles is that as human beings, with sight, and the amount of use sight, we're communicating with each other non-verbally in the circle, in my mind, constantly sending signals to each other about what's going on in the circle, who's to be listened to, who's not to be listened to. 
expect you to need it. So all that's for us if you're on a computer and the computer doesn't show you what's going on in the room. Whereas you just turn our head and see everybody's eyes. And we, and we deal with inclusion a lot within these different movements, within activism, but then we don't talk about actually including people that have different modes of perception. We have verbal language very well. And they will refer to kinesthetic or body or nonverbal or even, even like you said, olfactory, it could be anything. What the facilitators do is not trying to control you, they're trying to help you. Because if you communicate in a way that threatens other people in the room, they're going to stop listening. They're not going to hear what you have to say. And it's not your fault, that's just the way it is. So to help, if the facilitator recognizes that, it facilitates so it can actually help you express what you really want to say, isn't that better for everybody? So you got to let them, if they know what they're doing, you got to let them do it. And this idea, no, I can't stop it for two minutes because I can talk as long as I want, no, that doesn't work when there's you know, you have 20 minutes to have a, speech, a talk about something and there's 10 of us sitting here being for two minutes. That's the way it works. Otherwise, all voices aren't being heard. So anyway, other questions or anything else? Yeah, um, I'd like to talk to you more about that, that particular point later. Absolutely. But, but um, in terms of affinity groups, right? Yeah. Um, if you're living in an intentional community, or you're living in the same household, it seems like you already have a really big leg up to having an affinity group. Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you live, say, in an apartment in Brooklyn, and so do the rest of the people you know, and you know, you're all working at separate jobs, and you don't see one another on any kind of basis, and then you want to do an activity together, how the hell do you form an affinity group? I mean, that really is actually vital yeah, without having that kind of intentional community. Well, first, I would say start the intentional community. That's, that's where I'm at now. That's okay. actually the way to do it. Because, oh, yeah, yeah. because well, Ben and I are talking about doing forming a, a base, uh, an institute, a residential community, and bringing people in who we can be taught so they can learn what we're teaching. Because what we're realizing is we've all been poisoned. We've all been polluted. All of us, including Ben and I, when we're in the overculture, we're not functioning at our best. And this is what we want. And so if we're really going to teach this, we have to bring people in and actually have them go through a week of peace time before they can actually absorb what we're teaching them. It's that topic. Okay, that, that's where we're at. But recognizing again that that's not going to happen for everybody, um, this is the vision I hold. Again, the city groups are, are amoebas. We need to play this game. Raising hip.
but that's not going to happen right away. So but maybe some people can actually do that. Maybe you can have a roommate. Some of your roommate moves out, one of the people in your group can move in. They see how I'm growing organically. Okay? But also, let's say you actually make an effort to meet your downstairs neighbor. Okay, because they you happen to bump into them once you saw they were reading, you know, a book of radical or something, right? So you mentioned you have a finish group. Would you like to come to dinner and meet my group? Okay, and they come. So now you have two people in your building. You see where I'm big? I do. So you so keep doing that. Radicalize our building. And, 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 and it's growing. It starts with five people. It grows to ten or fifteen. And at that point, it splits along geographic lines. The people live close together for more. They don't have to do that. But because the value is environmental sustainability, that makes sense. And you still work pretty closely together, but now you're two affinity groups having two different dinners, or maybe, and then maybe once a month you have a common dinner. So you're going with that. And you just keep growing and splitting like that, growing from the inside and, and living out your values, making the affinity group come closer and closer to the true values you're living of cooperation, shared economies, defending each other when you're being attacked by the overculture. Things like that, which has to be kind of more regular contact more holistic, being able to do the social technologies I'm talking about, like being able to have a, well, there's actually this thing that the Heathrow community developed, which is a Heathrow check-in, which is what you can imagine a check-in is like, only it's structured and it goes way deep. It's like the commitment that you can't say no to somebody who wants to check in with you. I have a problem with you, let's work it out, and you can't walk away. And people do, of course, but that's not the commitment. You make it in your affinity group. If I have an issue with you, you will hang in there with me and work it out. And you will stay. Then you separate. You're not in the same affinity group. You're not. It's not, good, it's not a good match. But if you're an intentional community, and well, you keep trying to check in with somebody, and they will turn around and leave the room when you say, I need to check in with you. And they leave the room. And the rest of the community is going to be Men live in Utah for 15 years. I lived there for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. It happened with my that son, and he left the community because he kept checking in with this one guy. Who was he? Uh, uh, and he said, I have to and the, irony, and the irony of Heathcote is when you join Heathcote, you sign a conflict resolution contract which says that you will engage in the conflict. But then they didn't uphold it. And unless you elect them, not uphold it. So rather fight them, we left. It's sad, but it's like having to leave your family. Right, so it is. So we're going to start a new community. And we're, we're Ben and I are now both much more skilled at teaching than we ever did once. We have 45 years of experience between us, but the last few years we have amplified Try to share that for the past six months. It didn't go very well, but we're not giving up and things are happening. I, I told you earlier that we stopped stop saying that Staten Island is a public school. Hey, you know, the radical left doesn't want to hear what I have to say. I'm going to the public school. That's, that's pretty radical. I'm happy with that. So, you see where I'm going with that? It's both the idea of. And, and, and when I was in Chico, you we were there, and I was talking about the Buddhist model. I said, I, and I also mentioned, you may have heard me say, it's kind of a theatrical thing. It's like a theater piece to it. And in the theater of the oppressed, when I guess it's called now, I don't, I, don't like that. I don't really know exactly that. Means. But in the old days, it, 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 it's, um, you know, the little big theater, Julian Beck, who, whose grandson I helped raise. And I know this is pretty deeply. Um, the idea was is that you, you don't, one of the ways I express this, you don't take no for an answer from life. You have something you want to do, and when the obvious way to do it doesn't seem to work out, you don't say, it, you continue working it, you continue looking at it. So, one kind of example is the early days of Tina Hong, when we would be going to, to, to every got, every got all the mom and pop grocery stores and little cafes like everything, you know, the, the food co op. Once we were already getting all their food, and that was a lot, we were distributing it. And then we started going to look at larger operations, like the, the big universities, Harvard and MIT, in Cambridge. Each one of them had 10 cafeterias. Each one of those cafeterias wasted tons of food. Okay, what do we didn't want? But we wanted to break into that because we were ready for that. And immediately the unions refused to cooperate. With us. Bad idea, right? But we didn't give up. We started organizing, teaching. And the goal was to get them to understand that in fact this actually helped their members when they went out on strike. Because we fed them when they went out on strike. 
and that's what we were doing. We had to educate them about that. But once they actually got that, then they understood. Then, then they had the legitimate concern. They didn't want this more work for their workers without additional pay. Okay, so we worked around that issue. But that was a legitimate issue we didn't want to do either. You know, and, and ultimately we never finished that negotiation before well, that particular group fell apart. I stopped doing it for a while. And when I came back, um, the story. Anyway, that kind of not of looking at a situation and not you know, on thing, looking at you've got a group of friends, you want to form a finger, but you all set out. Okay, yeah. Okay, Ruth. I wanted to get these books. Oh, cool. They're $30, both of them. $150 and $20. Uh, we're going to get cash around. Um, there's ATM machine. I think right across the street. Okay. Store there. Cool. And, um, All right. I'll be in the middle of the round. Much of what most meetings are like are meant to be limited. Okay, we have certain group discussion techniques like everybody gets two minutes to go around the circle. Yes, you know that's very limited. In terms of process, that's very limited. A nominal process is a random order system. You just shout out and have a word of discussion. So it bounces around the room, it bounces around the concept. Um, and so in my model, the different kinds of structure to be linear, and the other kinds of structure to be nonlinear, because different people function under different circumstances. They have different learning styles, they have different expression styles, and they have different brain styles. This is like studying the brain that knows. So for some people, being allowed to be nonlinear is like a breath of fresh air. That makes a lot of sense to them. And at a gut level, not a sense of logic for that. At a gut level, it feels, and it feels comfortable. Other people that feel like it's sort of possible in this situation, the last one is not there. So both are legitimate. And, and what we have in society, overculture, that highly values that they may be the process and overvalue it. And so there's a denigration of the key value of non-linear process. And one of our words is not to value the new process. That we're very strong process. Wrong process, but we also believe in allowing time for the non within that process. And, and to that point, we are very clear that when people have an emotive experience in a meeting, rather than treating that as something that shouldn't have happened, even with the, even with the words of, can we help you or make it better, because that's because it shouldn't have happened. You think about it. So just being nice to a person when you have an emotive experience is not good enough. It's not their first thing. What you really want to do is create an environment and say, exactly, but let's not, let's not stop with the immediate reaction. Let's take a moment and really absorb what just happened. Everybody in the room, how you responded to that. That person just shouted, another person got hurt. How do you feel about that? It doesn't matter. So the answer is we can't do that in a linear way. So what you do is you bring a stop to the one minute each. Just in the top of your mind. How do you feel right this moment to the next to you? Second right. Second right. One minute. Okay, time's up now. They're going to for a minute. Okay, time's up. Let's go back to a minute. That's enough to honor that explosive moment. It could have been if somebody connected to a hurt feeling. You know, how much, you know, they just break down because uh, I almost didn't do something. I realized, you know, you can touch it really deeply. It's not just a negative thing. Because somebody has a, you know, they're giving up a call to report. I mean, it's a story. It's a mood. You know, usually just kind of, they sign up for a little bit, everybody's uncomfortable, and then we go right back to the meeting. But that does not honor that moment. To stop, to get, that's real. That's the way human beings are. Let's incorporate that. You want to come them up in this meeting. They have something to do with the Something valuable. We may not understand it. That's the kind of work we're trying to do. 
Okay. So, so, so we might say it's value in the temple, if you will, over the master. Okay. This is the this has been C.T. Butler, one of the co-founders of Food Not Bombs. Very interesting talk. about selling his books, but uh, looks like they're self-published, so I wouldn't uh, consider it a major uh, me to go corporate thing. Milk, because I haven't had any protein today, <laughs> not unhealthy for me, and I'm walking around with a bag of chicken, but I, I, I can't, you can't eat, you can't stop, you know? So sit down and eat. I don't, I can't, as soon as I do that, I start talking to people. So I'm thinking of giving my chicken away and just getting some milk over there, but I don't even want to... <laughs> you know how it is? Self-preservation comes first. Well, I'm learning how to ask for help, and someone made the suggestion of milk. We oh. had to start it. <laughs> but, 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 but you got chicken. <laughs> I got chicken, yeah. Why eat the milk? But the chicken's too hard to eat. Why? Messy. Oh. I can't talk. All right, I'm going to sit down and eat chicken. I'm going to tend to eat the chicken. <laughs> Are you eating chicken? I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe I might. I'm, I'm willing to sit down for a minute, though. Well, I just filmed that whole that, that whole meeting there. What are you going to sit in the shade of right there? Why don't we sit together and I will eat chicken and you can eat it? Okay. And I might even give you a little bit. Find a place of comfort. This is in the sun. I don't know. But it's a nice day. Um, as long as the breeze keeps blowing, I yeah. guess. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want to leave because Gino's here and he's going to end up singing We Are Victorious on the top of his lungs. Oh dear. Yeah. I mean, okay. What? You know him, right? <laughs> um, not offhand. I'll know him if I see him. Yeah, you will. He's going to out of town for the, the, I guess there's a big march tomorrow. Yeah, I didn't know about that. It's a hard day. It's a hard day to It's like, yeah, I know. I don't, I don't think I can do it. I, I can't. I'm going to see my father a little bit. But Okay, guys, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna pause for a little bit here, uh, do a save, and uh, munch on that food for a few minutes. Uh, we won't be long. Back up shortly.